How is everyone doing? I know. Wow, I'm happy that happened. You have to build a clapping culture early so that people will clap when you speak. It's very important. <laughs> thank you. I'm vegan, if I can get some claps for that. I'm a vegan, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm not talking about that, I'm sorry. Um, so, what's up? I am Herb Garrity, as it says. Uh, my birth name is Rosemary, so people like followed me on Facebook and are like, who are you now? Um, this is a nickname that I use. <laughs> um, so yeah, I am Herb. I'm the Director of Communications at Rehumanize International. If you have not heard of us, there's a table outside. Come hang out. Um, we are a secular, nonpartisan organization dedicated to creating a culture of peace and life. So that means that we oppose all acts of aggressive violence against human beings, no matter the circumstance. So while I do believe that abortion is the greatest human rights crisis of my lifetime. We also work to end things like war and the death penalty and police brutality and euthanasia and basically every instance of violence against human beings we oppose. So traditionally this has been called the seamless garment approach to human rights, but I am an atheist and I think that sounds too Catholic-y, so I prefer to call it the consistent <laughs> life ethic. And I think that that word consistent and consistent life ethic is really apt because so much of our model, modern political paradigm is marked with inconsistencies. I think that we've all heard or probably been screamed at, how can you call yourself pro-life when you love war or believe in the death penalty or support family separations at the border? And we know that regardless of what any particular pro-life person's stance is on any of those issues, is irrelevant and is not going to justify thousands of babies being dismembered every day, the people screaming do kind of have a point. Why care about the right to life of some humans in some circumstances, but condone violence against them in others? So I think that um, we can ask the opposite side the exact same question though. Why claim to stand for peace or justice while then supporting the discriminatory lethal violence of abortion? There's nothing peaceful about that. So what I like about the consistent life ethic is that no one's really in the clear. It can challenge everyone, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum or whatever your stance is on a whole host of issues. And that's what I really like about it because it can call people in instead of out. Because that's what we're doing when we say things like, you can't be pro-life and support the war in Yemen, or how can you call yourself a feminist when millions of pre-born girls are killed in the womb? Um, those things are calling out the opposite side. And I think it's really important to instead try to call people in and try to start from a position that says, listen, we might disagree and that's okay, but I understand that you're coming at this from a position that wants to help people, wants what's best for the world, and so do I. So I'm gonna be talking about a lot of different issues in this talk, not just um, abortion. And I wanna know, I, I wanna let you know that that's okay. Like, it's cool if you get mad at me because you support the death penalty or whatever. I invite you to talk about it with me over lunch or at our table or anywhere else. Um, so let's get started, I'm excited. Um, so in my talk today, this is called what's it? Bad Words, How Do Our Words Dehumanize? Um, also follow me on Twitter. <laughs> on there, on Instagram. <laughs> I, we sent this slide to Karen while we were sitting here and Amy was like, wait, add your, add your at. Um, so please follow me on Twitter and Instagram. But so what are bad words? I think the first thing that probably comes to your mind are a couple of four letter expletives that are certainly rude to use in a number of contexts, but they're not really that bad and they're definitely not what I'm talking about today. The bad words I'm talking about are words that seek to dehumanize. These often take the form of slurs, words that seek to other certain classes of human beings based on race, nationality, ability level, gender identity, sexual orientation, or any other immutable characteristic. These words tend to be obvious, earmuffs kids, but when I was called a dyke in middle school or a bitch by some guy on the street a few weeks ago, these were intentional. These were meant to dehumanize and that, that was known by the speaker. Slurs are used by people with certain privilege to other and dehumanize those below them on the social hierarchy. What is perhaps even more insidious than slurs though is language that dehumanizes unintentionally or covertly. And this is because well-meaning people like us can get caught up in it. So let's take a step back. Why does this matter? Who cares if our words dehumanize because they're just words, sticks and stones, whatever. 
Well, there's two reasons. The first is that the words we use shape our perceptions. By using dehumanizing language, we negatively shape the way we view certain groups of people. We begin to view them as subhuman, and as studies have shown, when we view someone as less than us, it creates a psychological separation, which allows us to be more likely to support, to either support or commit violence against them. Something I'm sure that I don't have to tell a crowd of pro-lifers is that each and every human being has inherent dignity, and this is a result of our shared humanity. Our language should reflect that. Think historically. What are some of the ways that whole groups of people have been subjugated under the law? Slavery, the Holocaust, genocide of the indigenous people of the Americas. Before all of these acts of violence were able to be perpetrated against these groups, dehumanization had to occur. So Rehumanize International makes these cards. You can't really see from here. Um, but we have a bunch at our table outside, and I really recommend that everyone pick them up. Because on them, we have laid out different ways that some human beings have been dehumanized throughout history and today. Um, so it has African Americans, Native Americans, um, European Jews during the Holocaust, the elderly and disabled, and of course, preborn human beings. And I think that this card is really interesting, um, and the way that I didn't do this. I say like we did it. It was our summer intern and Amy made these cards. <laughs> but so this card that I made is so great <laughs> because it really shows clearly, I think, the parallels between the way that dehumanization has worked historically and the way that it's working today and how we can kind of be a part of that dehumanizing rhetoric. So for example, for example, the Nazis openly referred to Jewish people as parasites or other animals. This was a rhetorical move that the American media obviously condemned while then turning around and calling the Japanese yellow vermin to justify things like immoral internment camps and eventually the mass murder of civilians in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. In fact, two days after those hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children were killed by the American military with the atomic bombs, our president, Harry Democrat, Harry S. Truman, I always have that. Whenever a Democrat does something bad, I put it in there. Um, president Harry S. Truman defended this decision saying, the only language they seem to understand is the one we have been using to bombard them. When you have to deal with the beast, you have to treat him like a beast. It is most regrettable, but nevertheless true. So flash forward to today. How many of us have heard pro-choice people saying, the fetus is just a parasite on the pregnant woman's body, or despite the mountains of evidence that they actually contribute to and improve the economy, immigrants being referred to as parasites or dangerous animals. This is similar to the invention of the term welfare queen to paint poor, typically black women and mothers as undeserving burdens, parasitic on the system. There's a common thread. Instead of viewing people as human beings, First, there is often incentive to view them as only tools for financial loss or gain. I think this is pretty clear when we look at the abortion industrial complex. They claim that they're so necessary because they're there to help people facing crisis pregnancies, when in reality, we know that organizations like Planned Parenthood are merely profiting off of those crises by selling lucrative abortion services in place of any actual help. That's why, according to their own annual report, the 26, for in 2016, for every one person they provided with prenatal care, Planned Parenthood performed 41 abortions, and for every adoption referral, 82 abortions. It's why over 96% of pregnant women who walk into a Planned Parenthood for pregnancy-related services walk out without their baby, whose body is now either in a medical waste bin or be getting ready to be shipped off to the highest-paying researcher. And I think that... We see this and we see it as a clear method of dehumanization and don't apply it to these other issues, right? So we know that for the abortion industry, you can't sustain your business and also buy your executives Lamborghinis and also actually help women. It's just not good for their bottom line. It's why they claim that they need millions and millions of our tax dollars or else women will suffer while using their super PAC to fund millions and millions of dollars um, into funding democratic campaigns. Profit is frequently a motivator of dehumanization. Hi, Karen. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's just the slide. That's fine. <laughs> um, profit is frequently a motivator of dehumanization and violence. 
Oh. Wow, that was so aggressive. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Anyway, it's no coincidence that on the other side of the political spectrum from Planned Parenthood, we see weapons manufacturers pouring money into electing Republicans who they believe will champion their hawkish foreign policies, probably dehumanizing the citizens of whatever country they're campaigning to bomb in the process. I was first really introduced to the way that we so often, hey, <laughs> the way that we so often dehumanize those so-called foreign enemy combatants in an article on antiwar.com a few years ago. In it, Robert Kohler discusses a piece in New York Magazine that described discrepancies in NGO reporting versus the Pentagon's numbers. In it, he states, but the article notes, the official numbers also reveal a sharp uptick in civilian deaths. And suddenly, I have to scream stop. Every dead person is a human being. At some point, at some point that has to matter. An uptick in civilian deaths? When I deconstruct this language, I encounter a shrug of indifference a detached sense of necessity. What can you do? If the dead were Americans, white Americans, would the words be so cold and detached? On September 11th, 2001, there was an uptick of dead office workers in New York City. So since reading this, I've, it has totally shifted my perception of how we view the victims of the military industrial complex and how my own language can unintentionally contribute to the ideology that some lives matter more than others or that some deaths are somehow more tragic. I think that this really matters because it shapes how we view these issues, how we talk, and on a societal scale, it can shape policy. Take the recent wave of high-profile celebrity suicides we've seen this summer. Of course those losses are tragic, all over social media, there have been eulogies and people campaigning for greater mental health awareness and for access to treatment. Those are undeniably good things, but I have to point out a small inconsistency that I've noticed. Some of those publicly mourning the deaths of wealthy celebrities are the same people pushing for greater access to assisted suicide in this country. On the surface, this was odd to me at first, but when you dig deeper, and look at it through the lens of the historical oppression and dehumanization of disabled people, it starts to make a lot more sense. Very few proponents of assisted suicide believe that this right should be given to all Americans. For example, in no state can I, a physically healthy 22-year-old with depression, be treated with physician-assisted suicide. It just won't happen. Rather, a patient must have some sort of illness or qualifying condition and it is for this reason that nearly every major national disability rights group that has taken a position on assisted suicide opposes the practice. They intimately understand that the way assisted suicide legislation has been drafted creates a clear contrast between the rights of the disabled and ill and the rights of the physically healthy. It's even more concerning when examining the mountains of research that establishes that mental health issues, including suicidal ideation, are frequently comorbid with disabilities, particularly terminal illnesses. Assisted suicide, like many acts of discrimination, relies on the idea that some lives are worth more than others and creates a legal double standard where some are given suicide prevention and others are given suicide assistance in the form of a poison pill. This is just part of a long history of the sick and disabled being treated as subhuman and being given grossly different standards of care than the healthy. Think back to the horrible case of Terry Schiavo and the thousands of people every day who get referred to simply as vegetables. Talking about disabled people in this way is so ingrained in our culture that I think we often don't notice that we're using dehumanizing language and referring to someone incorrectly as a mere object. Yet this form of non-sexual objectification is all too common. Another example is the way that we use certain people's pronouns. Something I see online all the time, and I'm not getting into a gender debate here, is trans and gender non-conforming people being referred to with it pronouns. When you do this, not only are you not respecting how the person wishes, you, wishes for you to refer to them, but you're refusing to refer to them as a person at all. And this is being done to a segment of the population that's already at a much higher risk of experiencing um, physical and sexual violence. It's important to remember that calling someone it doesn't remove their gender, it disregards their humanity. And I don't think that's something that pro-life people want to be doing. 
Another version of this that I talk about all the time and I think is actually hilarious is the way that everyone dehumanizes preborn children by calling them it. Like we do it all the time in our conversation earlier with the people outside, every pro-life person did it at some point. We were like, yeah, well it's, you know, when it reaches that level and like we're constantly referring to babies as it. And I really don't think that that is like the cause of abortion. Um, and it's not as serious as the other forms of dehumanization that I've been talking about. But I do think it's really interesting. And I really wonder if when, as a society, we finally get to a point where we recognize the humanity of the preborn on a large scale, if this kind of speaking will generally fade away. I hope it will at least. Okay. So moving on to another way that human beings are treated as objects or something other than humans. When people are referred to or treated as property, this concept of people as property is obviously the ideological basis for all acts of slavery throughout history, from the Jewish people in Egypt to American chattel slavery to the modern exploitation of incarcerated humans through the forced and severely underpaid prison labor. This ideology is also present, though, in the way that we treat, or the way that our laws treat the advancement of reproductive technology. According to the law, Embryonic humans created via in vitro fertilization are the literal property of their parents or researchers. Earlier this year, a freezer malfunctioned at a fertility clinic in Ohio and caused the death of thousands of tiny human beings. Do you know what the bereaved parents seeking justice were offered? A refund. I'm still mad about that. <laughs> When one, couple, when one couple affected attempted to sue for the wrongful death of their children, the judge wrote, the parents may believe that their embryos they created are already persons, but that is a matter of faith or their personal beliefs, not of science and not of law. Now, this leads us to what I think is the most effective form of dehumanization, the idea of a human non-person. It's so effective because it relies on partial truth. They're not denying the humanity of the person or group they're trying to oppress. Rather, just that this standard isn't as important as we think. It's why we have the anomaly of a pro-choice embryologist or doctor. Of course, no self-respecting believer in science will deny that the product of a same species reproduction is also a differentiated member of that same species, or that during human reproduction, what is produced at fertilization or conception is a genetically distinct whole living human being. Like, we've been over that argument a million times. Every scientist will agree with that. However, what they try to do instead is say that this human with unique DNA is not a human being or a person. And while I appreciate the work of countless pro-life activists who have came before me and who are in this room and who I look up to, um, I appreciate the work that you've done to try to include the preborn into the legal definition of personhood. I would like to offer, though, a humble suggestion. I contend that this very concept of personhood is an illegitimate social and legal construct that throughout history has been used almost exclusively to discriminate against whole classes of human beings. I believe in human rights not person rights, because the idea of personhood is ultimately a political or ideological debate that ignores basic scientific facts. If there could ever be the category of a human non-person, then personhood is either a useless signifier at best or dangerous and deadly at worst. If we're going to claim to be supporters of human rights, which I think we should, we should be applying them to all humans. Earlier, I said that there were two reasons that we should avoid using dehumanizing language. The first being that it shapes our perceptions of how we view people. The second though, and I think possibly more important, is that dehumanizing language simply isn't true. In our culture seeped in fake news, it's, I hate saying that, but in our culture seeped in fake news, it is necessary to state that truth matters. Without correctly calling something what it is and understanding it as such, it's impossible to come to an accurate moral position on how to treat that thing. And when that thing might be a human being, it really matters. To dehumanize means to use our words to take away the humanity of someone. But here's the thing, you can't do that. It's impossible. Our humanity belongs to us despite the words that people may use. Regardless of our age, size, race, gender, identity, sexual orientation, nationality, immigration status, ability level, or anything else, we are all equally human. This isn't an opinion, it's a scientifically demonstrable fact. We gain our humanity at the moment of sperm egg fusion during a process of fertilization, 
and we do not lose it when we cross a border or develop a disability or take cross-sex hormones or commit a crime or do anything other than die. Human beings are never objects or parasites or beasts or anything other than human. And this is true from conception to death. Thank you.